Hey everyone, welcome to today's quick learn sessions on creating icons for the web using Adobe Illustrator. I am Susie Johannes and with me I have Tanil Fincham. Um, Tanil's going to be here helping monitor the chat in case you have questions um, or anything else uh, that you want to see again or any other uh, requests. Um, today's quick learn session, if you haven't been a part of these, uh, they're topic-based webinars, so today we're just going to focus on icons and Illustrator. Um, we're holding these typically around the lunch hour, and at the end of today's session, I'll flash a slide that has all of the other sessions that are a part of this spring series. I'll also send out... Um, an email with any links to questions, things like that. Like I mentioned, if you do have a question, we ask that you submit that through the chat. Or if you want to see something um, demonstrated again, feel free to enter that through the chat. Um, and like I said, I will send out that email notification afterwards with any answers to questions. It'll also have a link to the recording of today's session. So we are recording the session today, and we will eventually, hopefully by the end of the week, put it up on our Quick Learn web page. Um, so I'll include the link to that so you can you can see it if you need to. If this is one of your first times joining the Skype for Business meetings, it's best to maximize your window so you can see my screen as large as possible. Also, you all should be muted at this point, but um, it's good to stay muted um, just to cut back on cut down on feedback. Uh, if you do want to enter a question through the chat, there's a small icon that looks like a little message icon in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. You can click on that to see any chat conversations that are happening or to uh, submit your own, sorry about that, your own uh, question or comment. And then finally, in the upper right-hand corner, you may have some options for different viewing options. So especially if you're joining through the Skype web app, you have different um, layouts there that could help you see things larger if you need to see things larger. All right, today's session, we're going to cover um, mostly focusing on icons. So we'll talk a little bit what, about what icons are and just uh, what an Illustrator is. And then we'll kind of follow the process that you would take to design a set of icons. So we're gonna go find some images, we'll talk about some Google search tips, how to find things that are labeled for reuse, downloading those, and then we'll go into Illustrator, we'll set up our artboards, we'll place our images, and we'll use uh, uh, Illustrator's tracing feature in order to create um, different vector objects. With that, we'll be able to break those images apart. We'll be able to change the colors, um, alter them, that type of thing. As part of altering those icons to make them look like a cohesive set, we'll use the different tools in Illustrator for moving and copying and resizing elements. We'll alter the path. We'll talk about using and working with shapes, changing the fill color, changing the stroke color, and then other effects and options. And then finally, we'll end with just options for saving, options for exporting. Also, if you um, have tips for, uh, if you want to create what are called SVG or scalable vector graphics for the web, some tips there um, on how to set up your artwork. Okay, so we do need to talk a little bit about what is Illustrator. Illustrator is just a vector-based software program. It's best used for manipulating type or shapes such as logos, icons, image elements. It's great for projects or images that will have one or multiple formats that will change in size. And you can use it for single page documents. You know, if you're going to go past a single page, I would suggest probably using InDesign, but you can do it, use it for simple layout. Now, one of the reasons why it's great for icons and things that will change in format is because of this uh, vector-based kind of behavior. So with that, um, you know, the image on the right, that's an image created in Illustrator. The image on the left, that's an image created in Photoshop. And so the difference between the two, on the right, the Illustrator graphic is a vector graphic. And so to create that shape, Illustrator basically maps out different points and then mathematically determines the path between the points to create the solid areas or the outline of the shape and which is then filled with a solid color. Um, because of that you can scale that graphic infinitely larger or smaller and it shouldn't lose, um, technically not lose any resolution. 
Um, the Photoshop graphic, on the other hand, on the left side, that's referred to as a raster-based or pixel-based graphic. And when you create images in Photoshop, those uh, images are comprised of individual pixels. So when you try to scale those graphics up, you'll often, at a certain point, see pixelation or rasterization um, after the, the pixels become, you know, at some point too enlarged. Um, so a really great thing that we'll be doing today is creating these uh, icons in Illustrator. I'm not going to cover like what sizes to make the icons and things like that. That's always that's going to depend on your application. But because of Illust Illustrator's nature, you can size those um, in uh, different formats. All right. Um, at work, if you need Illustrator on your computer, you should talk to your tech support staff. 50% um, of our machines can get it, so most likely you can get it on your uh, KU managed machine. And then at home, KU employees, faculty, staff have a negotiated license with Adobe, and so you can purchase a year subscription of Creative Cloud through KU Software Web Store for your personal computer. I'll include that link in the follow-up message, and it's a really great discount, um, a really great uh, benefit for faculty and staff. For students, you should be able to find Illustrator in most any computer lab on campus. And then there is a student negotiated rate through Adobe. Um, I believe at this point it's $20 per month. So um, no KU negotiated discount, but the existing discounted rate that Adobe already has. Um, so I want to talk first just about what icons are. So icons is, are what I mean by these little images here. So they're usually just a simple image element that's easily recognized. And then the key with these icons, what, what we'll be working toward today is creating a consistent set so that all of the icons look like they were created um, by the same designer for the same purpose. All right, so we're going to start here just by finding some images to use uh, for the basis of our icons. Um, and then we'll go through these other steps here. So um, I'm just going to open up uh, Google. And um, the number one tip here is use Google search to find your images. So here I'm just going to type in light bulb in the image search. And here I get the basic image search, but if I want to find images, the important thing is to actually look at the images tab. So here now when I'm on the images tab, I can click there, I can see different photographs, things like that. Um, now in the images search here, you have different keywords where you can narrow or change your results. You also have this area here called tools. That area, especially when you're in the image search, will give you image search specific tools. So you may find that you can possibly, you know, limit the type from any type to just clip art. You may find that that gets you some results that you like. Uh, what I found is that instead of using this clip art, that uh, usually if I include the word icon um, in my search, then I'll get icon looking graphics or images. The other thing when you're repurposing this artwork from uh, the web, oftentimes you want to make sure that you're using things that are available for use. And so another benefit of using Google um, image search is they have this usage rights area. So here you can um, choose this labeled for reuse. Um, that could be a good option here of things to use, especially when we get into like more generic looking light bulbs. Um, those should be fine to use. Um, in the slides that I'll send you, I'll include the contact information. There's some really great resources at the library who can help you if you want to learn more about images that you can use. So Josh and Ada are very helpful and they have a website that has different kind of distinctions. They also have a lot of knowledge when it comes to Creative Commons, which is kind of its own language, um, designating when things are able to be reused, reused with modification, that type of thing. 
Um, so in this case, these images here look pretty basic. You know, it's surprising how simple an image like this would take, how long it would take to create an illustrator. So just by starting here, we'll be saving some time. So what I do once I find an image I like, I'll click on it here, I'll just preview it, and then I'll come um, in the panel to the right here and I'll just say view image. Once I see that image, I'll usually just right click, say save image as, and I'll save it to my desktop. Now even though this one says SVG here, it's going to save it as this PNG file type and we should be okay to use that. Okay. Um, so that's just the basics of searching for images within Google. A lot of you guys probably know that, but um, maybe you didn't know that there's these extra tools when you're actually in the image search. Another thing that I have been looking at recently um, is including, instead of just icon, including flat icon into my search. And I find that that results in icons that are really great for this image trace feature I'm going to show you. So sometimes when you get these photographic style images, they don't the tracing result doesn't appear um, as clear or crisp. Uh, it's not as workable as having something that's more like one or two colors. Okay. So now um, within Illustrator, first I'm going to create my artboard. Um, and so what we're going to be working toward in this session is something like this. So I basically, you know, used, found these different images as just pictures on the web labeled for use and I've downloaded them to my computer. So to set up this kind of artboard here, I'm going to come up here to file. I'm going to say new. And then the big thing here is if you are planning to use these for web under profile, choose web. That will give you a few things. It'll give you RGB colors, which are web or digital colors. It will also give you uh, pixel base or pixels as your unit. And then finally, it will give you the default screen resolution. So that's a good place to start. Now in this case, because we are creating an entire set of icons, we want to have multiple artboards. So here, instead of one artboard, I'm going to type in 15. Um, here to get this kind of layout where I have, you know, them side by side, I'm going to choose how many columns across I want these to go. And so here I'm going to say five. And then finally for the width and the height, I'm just going to make these 100 by 100. So I'm just kind of guessing at a generic size um, and then I'll click OK. All right, so now that I have my different artboards, um, I'm going to actually place my images onto the different artboards. So to do that, I'll come up here to File, and I'll choose Place. All right, so I'm looking at my desktop now. I have a bunch of different files here. In order to place multiple files at once, I can select this entire series by selecting the first image, holding down the Shift key, and selecting the last image. Now if I have outliers here that aren't in a series like this, another shortcut is the control key. So here when I'm selecting files, the control key will let me select just um, kind of individual files without selecting an entire series. So that whole shift select, um, that works across a bunch of different programs and then control to select different items or different files. And then now I can just come down here and click place. I could have also just selected one file and then come, came down here to um, choose place. But in this case, I'll be doing um, hopefully uh, a quicker work placing these. So I'll go ahead and click place. So now I have my images. They're right there on my mouse to place. Now the tip or trick here is instead of clicking once and let's see if I zoom out, uh, placing that at full size. The key here is to, I can do a control Z and take a step back, actually click and drag as you're placing your images to resize those images as you place them. So that's going to save me some work as far as resizing goes um, by just having them start off 
as the correct size. So I just have a few more here. Um, and you can see how much time I'm saving because each time I don't have to go back to file place to place a new one of these. All right, cool. So now that I have these images on my artboards, um, you know, I can't actually do anything with these images yet because they're all just basically like pictures. So what I want to work towards is having things that are actually individual objects so that I can change the color, possibly alter them, change the size, that type of thing. So this is where the image trace comes in. And again, I'll send the instructions exactly how to do this um, in the follow-up. But there's basically um, three steps. So the first one is the actual image tracing. So here I, can, I have to first select my image to get the image trace button. Now, if I just click on the image trace button, um, and, and here, because this is a large image, it's giving me this warning, I may or may not get a very good result. So here now, it looks like you know nothing's there. And that's because of this preset. So this preset is set to default. I may have to choose a different preset that will work better for my graphic. So here, I just changed it to, um, three colors, depending on how big your graphic is, how detailed it is, it may take more time um, for some graphics versus others. So I'm actually gonna stop that one. Here, I'll do the same thing. Now in this case, because it's just black and white, that default trace actually looks perfect. So the main thing here is just to make sure that once you image trace, it looks like the original. Um, and then once you have it like you like it, if, if this didn't look correct, I would come here to preset and choose a different preset. But as long as it looks correct, the last two steps here are to expand. So there's an expand button that will actually break it apart into separate shapes. And then finally, I wanna come up here to object and choose ungroup because by default, once you expand the entire objects, all the objects will be grouped into one group. So now I can say ungroup and what that allows me to do is to select all of the different elements here. Um, so I'm going to do another one here and just to kind of review that again. Now in this case, you know, I can click image trace here. It's not going to look correct. Um, I'll probably need to come back here to preset. I don't know. I'm just going to choose 16 colors because because there are a lot of colors. I didn't take note of how many. So that looks right to me. Um, since it looks okay, I can click expand and then I'll come up here to object and I'll say ungroup. So now I have all these different shapes here. Okay, so to save some time, I went ahead and I created one that looks like this. Okay, great. Um, so here, just um, moving into some more general Illustrator tips and tricks, uh, methods for using Illustrator. Um, first of all, just navigating around the workspace. There is a zoom tool down here, and there is this hand tool for actually moving the artwork. What I prefer to do is Control plus to zoom in and Control minus to zoom out. If you are focused on one or selecting one object on one artboard, you can do a control zero just to zoom into that artboard. Um, so there's a bunch of different options there. There's also, you know, down here in the jump area, the jump menu area, you can do z different zoom le levels. Um, also under view, there's all sorts of different options such as fit all and window. Um, so here, now that I've kind of covered that, the next thing, uh, oh sorry, one more thing, sorry. You can scroll up and down using the scroll wheel on your mouse, but another thing that can be helpful for moving side to side is the hand tool. And the, the trick or tip here is you can come over here and select the hand tool to move side to side, 
Or if you have another tool selected, you can hold down the space bar and that will get you the hand tool. And then you can click and drag in order to reposition that uh, artboard within view. Okay, so um, my ultimate goal here with these icons is to make them all look like they're a part of the same set. So right now, these three kind of look alike. These kind of look alike. These look alike. These are kind of just outliers. So I have a choice here. I could try to make these other ones look like these three with this black outline. I could try to make them all look like this black and white, or I could kind of find some middle area that looks more like maybe these ones. So that's what I'm going to do. So again, the end result should look something like this, um, but I'm going to start by um, just subtracting some of the stuff I don't need and just kind of eliminating it down to the basic elements. So here in my traced and expanded one, I'm just going to delete all the extra stuff because uh, that I don't need. So for example, the circles that come with this artwork, I'm going to delete those. Um, it's important to click outside of your traced image. Oftentimes there's like a white box here. And again, the way that I do this, I didn't actually say that, to click, to click and select entire objects um, and, and then to delete them, you're going to use the black arrow. So the black arrow or the selection tool, that's how you're primarily going to use, that's the tool you're going to use the most, and it's going to be how you can select entire objects. You can then get the different resize handles, things like that. In this case, I just use the black arrow to drag this out to the side, and then I just hit the delete key on the keyboard. I could also come up here, say edit clear or edit cut to get rid of this. But I'm just coming along here with the black arrow, selecting things that are not the object and just getting rid of them. Um, and I happen to know these are here because I, I tried this out, but you'll, you'll probably discover things as you go. All right, so now that I have those deleted, um, I may want to just generally move and resize my artwork so that it's all kind of relative the same size and I could do this in a different order. Um, so to select things again you're going to use the black arrow. Now if you've ungrouped things you may find that the black arrow isn't selecting everything that you want. Um, we'll talk more about how you can kind of navigate that but in this case with this one uh, this icon here, if I select this, this is all just kind of one group. I can see that if I try to move it. So if I want to resize it, I have these handles out here on the sides. Now the key here, the tip or trick, is to hold down the shift key while you drag in from the corners. And what that will do is it will keep the artwork in uh, proportion as you're resizing. So now that looks a little bit more on the same scale as these other shapes. I could also, if I wanted to do this more manually, there's other like uh, scaling options under object, transform, and scale. But in this case, if I'm just using the black arrow and I select a shape and it's still grouped together, then I can transform the whole thing at once. Now in this case with this map, if I select something here, these are all separate shapes. So in order to select all of this, I can use the black arrow and draw a marquee or a box around that. And what that will do is it will select everything that um, that marquee overlaps with. So now I can hold down the shift key. I can um, move that. Uh, down and I can treat it all as one object. Now if I didn't want to, if I wanted to make sure this was always treated as an object, I could also come back up here to object and then say group and I could group that all as one. I'll just go ahead and do that so that uh, it's always selected and moved together. All right, so um, 
Oh, I forgot to pause for questions. I'm going to pause for questions now about um, any of the process that we took to actually um, trace these or expand them, ungroup them, that type of thing. Okay, I'm going to keep moving then. Um, so in order to make these all look like they're one set, one easier way to do that, easy-ish way, is to just give them all the same kind of treatment in the background. So here in this example, I'm just going to give them all a circle, and the circle is going to have a KU color associated with it, and that's going to be one thing that helps me easily tie them all together. So for that, I could just draw the circle here. If I did that, like I'll just do that without explaining it first, it would just place that on top of the image. So instead of doing that and then maybe sending it to the back or something like that, I'm going to come over here and there's a little panel that looks like two sheets of paper called layers. So layers are a way, you know, they appear in Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign. They're a way of more manually forcing that kind of arrangement from the foreground to the background. So right now, by default, every Illustrator document has one layer called Layer 1. And so everything that we've added so far has been put on Layer 1. If we want to put something in the background, we can come uh, on that panel and expand it. And then we can click on this little piece of paper with a corner turned up, uh, create new layer. That'll create a layer too. Now again, we're not quite done here because even though we have the layer selected, if we put, place an object there, it's still going to be on the foreground. So to eliminate that, we can just drag that layer and drop it below layer 1 so that layer 2 now is always in the background. Now as we draw our circles in the background, we want to make sure that we're not affecting our uh, images in the foreground. So this column here that's currently blank, we can um, click in that area and actually lock that layer one. So now um, I won't actually be able to select anything that's already there and possibly move it or change it. All right, so to draw a circle here, um, I could just kind of eyeball that and I will get these smart guides as I draw it. Another tip or trick here is if you hold down the shift key while you draw that object, it will keep it in perfect proportion. So here I'm drawing a circle. If I wanted to do like a square, again, I could hold down the shift key and I could keep that in perfect proportion. When you're working with objects like squares, you may notice these little bullseyes in the corners. That's called live corners, and it's one way that you can easily, using the black arrow, drag and drop in to round those corners. For the example here, we're just going to be using the circle or the ellipse tool. And in the case of the ellipse tool, I actually have to click and hold on the rectangle tool in order to locate that. So it's, it's hidden or nested below that rectangle tool. Um, so again, with the ellipse tool, I just, uh, you know, started in the corner, held down shift, and drew my circle. Now, if I wanted to be very exact here, um, with that circle selected, I could come up here in this transform area, and I could just double check. Here I can see it's 100 pixels by 100 pixels, which is exactly the size of our artboard. I also see my alignment or my reference point is in the top left hand corner and that's placed at 0, 0, which is exactly where I want it. All right, so I could do that, you know, repeat that across these other artboards. Some other strategies that might help, if I copy this circle and then click onto my next artboard, I can actually come up here and say edit, paste in place, and that will actually paste it exactly where I want it on that artboard. So that may be even a better option. And I don't even have to copy it again. I can just move across saying edit, paste in place. And it will always be exactly the right size and lined up exactly. So that's one option. Um, now that I have a whole row here, I can actually you know, copy all of this and just move it down here. Um, 
in order to select all of these circles at once, I could, with a black arrow, just draw a marquee to select them all. Or in the case of this, because that's the only, you know, my first layer is locked, I could just do a control A to select all. Now another tip or trick here, um, I could copy, paste, and place. Another option you have, which is kind of cool, is Alt, drag, and drop. So if I hold down the Alt key and I drag these down, and I can kind of use the smart guides to make sure I'm in the right place, when I release on my mouse, it's just going to create a copy for me. Uh, of those shapes. So a really easy way, especially when you're creating icons or you have multiple things, is just alt and drag, drop. You just create copies as you're dragging and dropping. Alright, so here I've created all of my different circles. I've got them on a new layer that's unlocked. Um, I've hold, held down shift to keep those in proportion as I was dragging them. Um, now I need to change the color of these circles and for this I need to know kind of what this panel down here means. So when I select an uh, object here I need to pay attention to this panel and let me bring up a slide here. So the panel is a little bit confusing at first. There's two icons. The icon that's always on the left is the fill color, and that will be whatever the inside of your object, what the color will be. If it is or this red slash, then it will be transparent, so it will have no fill. The icon on the right here, that's the stroke icon, which is also like the border. So in this case, this object would look like this down here. It would have a hot pink border or stroke, and then it would have no fill color. There are tiny icons in the uh, corners. The one in the top uh, right will just swap the two, and there's also a keyboard shortcut for that. So Shift X will swap the two. Um, there's an icon in the lower left. You can click on that if you want to return to the default stroke and fill, which is a white fill with a black stroke. Um, and then there's keyboard shortcuts, which is just the X key to toggle between the two. So uh, in my Illustrator document, when I have that shape selected, as long as I have the fill color on top, over here I have swatches. But what I've done is I've added all of the KU swatches, which I'll, I'll show you how to do that um, here towards the end. So just with my swatch colors here, as long as the fill's on top and I have my uh, shape selected, I can just select a new color and it will change just the fill of that color. So here I can just move along, kind of arbitrary, deciding what colors I want to make these. Um, there's also eyedroppers and things like that you could do in order to, to um, select and place colors. Um, now, if for some reason I had this stroke icon on top when I had chose one of these, um, what that would do is actually provide a border. In this case, I don't want that, so if I ever need to get rid of it, there's an icon down here. Um, as long as that border is on top, I can click on that icon and get rid of that. Okay, so it's all starting to come together. <laughs> um, here now, so I'm done with this background. I'm good with that. So I'm actually going to come back to the layers here. I'm going to kind of reverse what I did. I'm going to lock my circles now and unlock the top part or the, that top layer that has all these little image elements. Um, so, like I said, you can choose, you know, which way you want to go here as far as, like, if you want to, how you want to make these match. Um, some things that can help, in this case, because of these graphics, because we expanded them, I can actually select this kind of black outline here, and I can just, like, get rid of that. Now, some kind of weird stuff can happen where you get these like little artifacts and things like that. Um, so one tip or trick here, especially when you're using image trace, there's different 
uh, tools that are here under select or different selection options. And so like right now, I just selected another, well, I did have another little selection of that gray. So I can come here to a, a select, I can say same and then fill color. And that's going to select all of the same kind of shape. And then I can just uh, click delete to get rid of it. In this case, maybe I have to do this again. I selected another one, said select same, fill color. So now I can just kind of get rid of those um, different gray kind of uh, shapes. So like I said, I'm, I might have broken this into too many colors. And so that's why it's kind of more annoying to do, but uh, I could just work through there and get rid of those outlines. Well, you get the idea there. Um, the next thing here, you know, as I'm changing the colors uh, for this example, where it's kind of like a gradient, um, let's say I want to make this pencil now into the KU red. What I can do is I can select kind of a medium value and change that to uh, the KU red. Now here, you know, I had that selected. I selected red and the stroke was on top. So I can just click on this icon here and swap the two and then I could get rid of the stroke. Or I could have just uh, gotten rid of that, clicked back here. So now I'm working with the fill and then changed my color. Um, but to get these variations here for the different sides, um, I can select a new side here. And what I can do is come up to the tints panel and it will show me the colors I've most recently used. So here now, this is the KU red. I can choose an option that's a little bit darker. I can choose this one, choose an option that's a little bit lighter. And that will be more like uh, the KU colors. Um, same thing here, I maybe want to choose one of like the KU gray, grayish air, uh, colors. So I can do my medium value, come here, over here I can go to the, the, the tints kind of panel. What is that called? Color guide. And I can actually change to a darker and a lighter value. Um, so things like that will help, as, as, especially if you can maintain a consistent color palette. That will really help to bring your icons together and make them feel like they're one, uh, like they're one group or one set. All right. Um, other things that can help as far as this goes, uh, making things look like they're part of the same. Um, there's options here in this case where it broke it into several different shapes. So if I like delete, try to delete that blue or something like that, it's going to give me just a partial uh, object. There's a whole window here called window and pathfinder. So I've clicked on that and I have it over here. If you want to create more complex shapes by combining shapes, subtracting shapes, that type of thing, this Pathfinder panel will be really helpful. So in this case, I'm just going to, you know, use my black arrow to draw a marquee around that all those shapes and select them all. And then I can actually come here to Unite. And what that will do is it will just basically combine all the shapes so that it's one object. Um, so that can be helpful, especially if it's broken up into little shapes. Now in this case, now because it's one kind of grouped or combined shape, I can actually like change or select the parts individually. Even if I come up here to object ungroup, oh wait, I guess I can. So um, scratch that, you can ungroup it. The other option I had here though is if you want to keep this all as one, one group. Uh, the white arrow, so we haven't really talked much about the white arrow, but the white arrow, the direct selection tool, will allow us to just select individual shapes within a group, and then we can just change the colors of those shapes. And, um, you know, you'll just work through making sure things are the same shape, or sorry, the same colors as your whole palette, 
and relatively the same size, uh, that type of thing. When it comes up here to these message icons, that gets a little bit more complex because I have a lot of different kind of pieces here. So I'm going to do that select same fill color, just get rid of that. In this case, you know, I might just drag this off to the side and just use this main shape here so that I can keep it pretty simple. Now in the case of this, I have these little boxes here that were created by those open overlapping shapes. To get rid of those, I could either just use a rectangle and cover those up. So I could do something like that. I could even, you know, like select those and then use that same option under the Pathfinder to combine them. So that would work. The other option here is if you have kind of like holes in your shapes after you've live traced is uh, I'm going to select a way to get rid of my selection Using the white arrow, you can just select those paths, and then you can hit delete twice, and it will just get rid of that hole um, that's been punched out of your shape. So now, you know, I can just use my, my alt kind of trick here and make one different color, and now I've got some, some boxes. So all that started to really make these look like they're one set. Um, Beyond that, there's, you know, different things you can do um, as far as adding effects and things like that. In this case, I'll probably just leave these as flat, but just so you know, there's effects, stylized, there's drop shadows, feathering, glowing. Uh, sometimes I don't think that looks the best, uh, especially if we're talking about images for web, um, but that is an option. Another option you have here, like, especially with this KU color palette I'm doing, if I have icons that look like this map that just have a ton of colors, I can select that object, I can come up here to edit, edit colors, and I can just convert all those to grayscale at once. So that's what I did in my like example, and then I was able just to choose, you know, the, just the little kind of map icon here and just change that to red. So, um, lots of different things you can do, but really by having the similar background and then similar color palette, you'll really start to bring those together. Um, I mentioned I would tell you about uploading these swatches. In the follow-up email I'll send you, I'll have a link to our page in my community. We've actually created the swatch library, both the RGB and the CMYK library. Uh, for you to use. So within your swatches, you can always come here to this little icon in the corner. You can say open swatch library and then you can choose other library. So I'll send you the directions on how to do that and how to get to those files. But basically, you know, as long as you have that saved somewhere, you can always open and load those KU swatches and that will save you some time in setting those up. Okay, so I want to pause there for questions before we move on into saving and exporting. Uh, questions there? Cool. Okay, well, we'll just keep moving. Um, so here, the most important thing I guess I'd want to do is just do a file save. Um, I'm just going to do a save as here, and the default is just going to be as an Illustrator file. That's totally fine um, for what I'm using it for. Um, you could choose a different file type, but here I'm just going to say save it as an Illustrator. Um, and I'll click OK. All right, so now when I'm actually going to create my objects for the web, um, what I want to do is show you this slide. There's a few different file types that you can use and the main ones I'm going to suggest that you use for icons like this is probably PNG and here there's a PNG 8 and a PNG 24 um, it doesn't really matter these 8 and 24 in Illustrator when you go to export it's just PNG so with this PNG file type, what you get the ability to do is to have transparency. And you can even have a little bit of an option to do like a transparency with a drop shadow on it. 
Um, so uh, here, PNG is going to be your default one to choose. Now, if you're interested, I'll also talk a little bit about this SVG. That's another file type. Um, and it's scalable, it's transparent, um, and you can use it for other things like here it says animations and that type of thing. So it's kind of um, being more widely used in web design. Um, so here I'll first talk about PNG. Um, an easy way to export these as PNG is just come up here to file and then export. So two things I want to do here. I want to change the file type as to PNG. And then the other big thing that's going to save me a lot of time is to check this box for use artboards. That's going to break up every single artboard into a different image. And so I don't have to like do that in Photoshop or something like that. Um, so I'm just going to create a new folder, just call it test. And then I'll just click in there to place these. Now these are going to be named whatever I have here, hyphen one, hyphen two, hyphen three. So I'm just going to get rid of this stuff here and then say export. The last thing I have, resolution. So your default resolution is going to be 72 pixels per inch. Um, you could change that here if you needed to, but that's the, usually the default for um, digital work. And then background color. So here we see that extra white area or what's appearing as white in the Illustrator file will appear as transparent. That's what we want. So we're going to say OK. Cool. So now we can go and we can check that out on our desktop. So here we have test. Um, so I have a new image for each one of my icons even my blank ones because I just went ahead and did that. Um, so I can use these images um, on the web. Um, I can actually use them in PowerPoint, things like that. Because the resolution is so low, they probably won't work well for a PowerPoint. Um, but I could also go back, export them as a higher resolution um, if I wanted them for those purposes. Um, now when it comes to the SVG file type, there are a couple tips and tricks. I'll send you these um, notes as well as a resource I found online. Um, with the SVG file, when we create those, it's going to create uh, basically code that um, kind of draws the shapes for us. And so in order to make the code as simple as possible, it's best to keep your shapes as simple as possible. So online I read that you should limit the number of shapes, limit the number of layers, remove anything that's unnecessary that's not um, important to your graphic. If you're using text, you'll want to convert that to outlines. You can do that as part of the export process. And then finally, um, you want to fit the artboard or sorry, the artboard to the artwork. So in the case of our example here, that's not a big issue because we have, you know, our artboard is exactly the size of our artwork. Um, but if we were just doing a simple image and just creating the artboard from scratch, we would want to go to Object, Artboards, Fit the Artboard, Fit to out Artwork Bounds, sorry about that, to shrink that canvas or that artboard to our artwork. Um, a couple other notes, you can't use SVG for slideshow images in the CMS as far as I, as far as I know, um, but you can use those for buttons, icons, etc. You can copy the, and paste the text directly into the source code of the page, or you can upload those SVG files as individ individual files in the CMS and then place them just like images. So. The options here for exporting those, same kind of process, I can say File, Export. Here, instead of PNG, I'll choose SVG, and I'll choose again, Use Artboards. I'll just create myself a folder, and I'll place those within the folder. Now here, I get the option Styling. There's some options here. Honestly, I, I don't know the ins and outs of this panel. I do know if you have text, you want to convert that text to outlines, um, most likely. Um, so here, I'm just going to leave this as the default and click OK. So 
So what I got with that is all of my different SVG files. Now you notice they look a little bit different than an SVG, or sorry, a PNG image. If I right click here and say open with or edit with, I can see that's just code that's drawing out the shape. Um, to give you an example of what this looks like, sorry about this. I did upload a sample here in our one of our CMS test sites, and you can just see um, they look pretty crisp. There may be some things I want to do here to eliminate any extra lines. So maybe I want to make that just one shape as opposed to having this kind of like shadow effect in this case, um, something like that. If I can figure out a way to simplify that, it may make it easier for it to render. Um, and then just to show you again how I place these, just behind the scenes in the CMS, I just placed them as an image. I went to browse server and I just uh, basically just uploaded my SVG files. So I'll just do another one here. And of course I'd want to keep, you know, add al alternative text, that type of thing. But I can just add those images that way. Um, and the benefit here is that ideally if people are reading these or viewing these websites at different um, screen resolutions or different screen sizes, then the images will always appear crisp. Um, they can always resize. Uh, to to look sharp. All right. Well, um, I'll stick around and uh, I'll send you these, some of these keyboard shortcuts. Those will be in the presentation slides. Also, send you just a cheat sheet for Illustrator in case you want it. The presentation slides that I'm going through here, they have those links to some different resources, um, different training opportunities, and also the last. Uh, this is the first, so the next uh, in our series of quick learn sessions, which you can register for just like you registered for today. Um, so uh, uh, I'll stick around in case you have any additional questions. If you don't, uh, feel free to uh, go ahead and eat your lunch, I guess, and um, uh, keep an eye out for that email. I should send it by the end of the week with a link to the recording and those additional resources I mentioned. Okay, thanks everybody.